Hey everyone, 4.34 a.m., that's Eastern Standard Time, July 18th, supposedly in the year of 2017. I'm going to be picking up today with the chapter White Slaves in the American Revolution. And before I start, I have to ask you, do you enjoy, do you like being lied to? And I ask that because I don't like being lied to. In fact, I'd like to believe that I am adult enough and uh, mature enough to handle the truth, whatever it may be. There is probably nothing, nothing I know of, at least intellectually, and this may be more all-encompassing than just intellectually. There's nothing that burns me up more than people, especially ministers and teachers who have assumed that office, saying things and distorting facts in order to support their own uh, theories, uh, to support their own narrative, their own dogma. I can't stand that. Absolutely can't stand that. Which is why, if I come along information that stares me right in the face and tells me uh, now we're talking about first of all from the Bible first and foremost also let's say an overwhelming preponderance of evidence historically but if I come across that evidence and it's staring me right in the face and it's telling me I am going to be your enemy if you continue believing and talking about and let's say just uh, being in support of your particular dogma or narrative I'm going to be against you I can't just decide to ignore that and I'll be the first to admit that between the Bible and the preponderance of history that anyone can uh, dig up and find to be true all in all or for the most part there are going to be a lot of things about all of it that are confusing and that are very hard to understand and you have to understand that there's a reason for that because if the events of history and if the reason for these events happening were clearly made known in the popular narrative it would change the entire face of the world today now whether or not you believe in the Anglo-Saxon kindred people being the actual descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or not, you, you have to admit that what I just said is true. That if all of the events of history and the dynamics of what has happened since the ascension of our Lord Yeshua the anointed one if they were all to come to light in a popular way take on the jacket of a popular narrative to where many knew and understood why things happened throughout history it would change the face of the earth it would change all of the dynamics of this earth 
<clears throat> so, well, many of you know that for the last couple of years, I have stuck very heavily to my guns uh, with biblical historicism. Biblical historicism concentrates mostly on Rome. And I really believed for a long time that that, that way of looking at history and the events that have happened, that that was the most accurate look at prophecy and specifically the giving of the revelation to John by our Lord Jesus. The thing is, I'm finding about, well, let's just say the uh, status quo of historicism. Besides the fact that I've said over and over again that it's full of holes, go further. To be a uh, standard biblical historicist, you have to start on certain assumptions. I'm not going to go into those assumptions right now, but I am going to say that when you, you go back and you start reviewing the material of the Bible, the overall story that we're looking at, the covenants uh, from Yahweh and to whom, and the words of Christ. And then you start trying to apply the historicist model as it popularly stands. And I know different people have uh, different ideas about historicism. I understand. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists have sort of their own um, particular theories. And um, Protestants, uh, such as Robert Carangola, uh, being a oneness Pentecostal, he has certain ideas and theories. A lot of these people are pulling a lot of their information from just a handful, a small handful of uh, theologians from the past. Um, men like uh, um, Eliot and Ganes and Wiley, probably the big three. And some of the things that bothered me as I was learning and listening to people that are exhorting the historicist narrative is that there were a lot of weaknesses that, for the most part, they really just chose to ignore. That's not honest. If you look at a piece of information, and that piece of information is staring you back in the face, and it is telling you, I am either true, or there is a high possibility I am true. And if you pay attention to me, I am going to mess up your dogmas. And you choose then to ignore what it is saying and go on your merry way, then essentially you're a liar. You're a liar by omission. Maybe not commission, but you're a liar by omission. I haven't yet claimed to anyone that I've got all the facts about much of anything. I claim I believe the God of the Bible. I believe everything he said. I believe his only begotten son, his anointed one, Yeshua. And all he said, I believe his apostles. I believe them. And at the same time, I believe that men 
have done their best to provide us with translations that support their own dogmas. The King James Version of the Bible is one of the finest examples of that. But there are others. Usually all you have to do is look at the translator's backgrounds and understand. A good example, another good example is the ESV, English Standard Version. Uh, the whole team of which were heavily Calvinists. What I'm saying is, it's so unfortunate because I don't want to point fingers. I don't. I don't want to say you know these people are purposely uh, going out there attempting to deceive us. All I can do is look at what's going on and look at who's doing and make up my mind whether or not that that seems to be uh, coming from someone who is in love with the truth or in love with a lie. It's all I can do. And when you consider the fact that those who hold some form of historicist doctrine, some form or another, that most of them, when they talk about Oliver Cromwell, and I've done this myself, you see, I did it in ignorance. I didn't even know this. But I had gotten a lot of my information from sources that I was, I was foolish enough to trust. But it's come to the point now where I don't really trust any sources. And nor do I ask anyone to trust me. Good grief, no. But check these things. You have, you got to do the work. You can't be passive and just listen to what people say and then regurgitate it. That's not growth. So in the past, Almost any time a historicist or someone that held a very similar view to historicism would talk about Oliver Cromwell. They would talk about him, of course, in such glowing terms, the Lord Protector of England. How he went into Ireland to protect the poor Protestants who were being... Uh, savagely and aimlessly murdered by the Catholic population. How he removed, who was it? Is it Charles, what is it, Charles II or Edward II? I'll have to check real quick. All of their names blend together to me. So I apologize. Eventually executed him. Raised this massive army, this like people's army, raised this massive army and it does all these exploits to seemingly you know put England in a very different direction and again every historicist that I've ever heard talk about him talks about him in glowing terms the thing that they fail to mention is the damage that Oliver Cromwell did not not only at the time, and how the men of Britannia, men who were not in his people's army and were subject to his brutality, not counting them, which they have a lot to say themselves, but when you consider Oliver Cromwell's reign was probably the decisive point of turning. England over and the English people, the Anglo-Saxon people, over to their enemies because Oliver Cromwell was the man who opened the floodgates of Jewry, international money-lending usurious Jewry. 
Now, you can take the position of so many out there that I've taken in the past, which has been, well, you know, what happens is every time Rome and their agents, their Jesuits, their Knights of Malta, their Opus Dei, you name it. And I'm not saying Rome, I'm not saying Rome does not have their fingers in many dirty deeds. I'm not saying that. You could say that every time that uh, they're involved in some dirty stuff, what they do is they put a Jew at the front so that everybody will get this idea that the Jews are bad where the Jews are pretty much, uh, albeit willing, but, you know, not at the top of the pyramid. I've believed this myself. I'm not 100% one way or another yet. But I have questions. I have things that I have to consider that I can't just sweep under the rug. For instance, are you telling me that for centuries now, centuries now, okay, since, since the 16th century, let's say at least the time of Cromwell, and that was just England. Since then, let's just say uh, Roman lords throughout the Holy Roman Empire have put... Jews in positions of uh, overseeing their finance because usury was, by the way, not allowed um, by edict of, of the Vatican. You, you, you would be excommunicated if you charged usury. So you could say, well, they've, they had used them in sort of a secret way, you know, to, to charge usury when it was still illegal in the Catholic Church. Then, <clears throat> you know, eventually they allowed some usury and you know, then things just snowballed, got worse and worse. But nevertheless, even today, we don't have to talk about just usurious loans. We can talk about um, people say that, well, Rome puts Jews... Uh, in charge of Hollywood so that we'll think that's a, an entirely Jewish thing when it's really Rome. Uh, Rome uh, puts Jews, maybe that people would say, well, Rome puts Jews at the forefront of the white slave trade, so we'll think it's the Jews and it's not Rome. Or Rome puts Jews at the forefront. That, that um, you know, Zionism, that Rome is actually behind that. And Rome is behind... Okay. I just have a question about all of that, if that be the case. And we know, it's not speculation, we know that according to rabbinic Talmudic law, that these men universally believe they would look at the Romans and consider them dogs, pigs, animals beneath them. So what's the odds of, say, Rome putting them into uh, these positions of power? Because they're positions of power. Whether you think they're being puppeted or not, Henry Kissinger is in a position of power. Okay? A lot of them are. What's the chances that they have been putting them in these positions of power as their puppets for five centuries and given the rabbinic Talmudic Jewish mindset that they would remain their loyal servants for five centuries without usurping power against them? And I'm not even going into the whole thing about Jesuits being started by Muranos. Because there's a lot of evidence that that is entirely possible. Ignatius Loyola, his name was Lopez. Spain was full of these Jews. Today they're called Sephardics. Sephardim. Lopez. Perez. It's why so many people in what is considered Latin America have names like that. Because these kind of people, they 
have no morals whatsoever. And, you know, people have always made fun of the Spanish that they, they go everywhere, everywhere they conquer, they have sex with everyone. I'm not sure that those are specifically uh, pure Europeans more than European Jewry, since we know that uh, they were the owners and maintainers of many, many ships that did a whole heck of a lot of trade, specifically slave trade. And when it wasn't slave trade, most of it was pretty dirty one way or another. We, we can't ever decide to just shut our mind off to real facts, real information, and weigh those things out. If you look at something and you say, it can't be, it just can't be, you are a liar. You will eventually commit lies of omission because you're saying that. We have to constantly weigh the evidence. We have to be noble, as the Bereans were. We have to find and compare all things by Scripture. And when the truth looks us square in the eye and says, I'm against you, we had better reconsider our position. <clears throat> so that's my soapbox for the day, and I will continue on with white slaves in the American Revolution. During the American Revolution, the Continental Congress, desperate for fighting manpower, permitted the recruitment of white slaves into the army, which was tantamount to granting them their freedom. This was not particularly radical, however, in view of the fact that four score and seven years before Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Lord Dunmore, the royal governor of Virginia, freed the Negroes in his jurisdiction in the hope that they would join the Ethiopian regiment he had formed and fight the Patriots. Ronald Hoffman, pages 281 and two, through 282. In 1765, a 14-year-old Irish lad, Matthew Lyon, was orphaned when his father was executed along with other leaders of the, in quotes, White Boys, an Irish Farmers Association organized to resist British government confiscation of their farmlands. The boy was enslaved and transported to America, where he was purchased by a wealthy Connecticut merchant. Later he was made to endure the shame of being sold to another master in exchange for two deer, which was a source of no end of scoffs and jeers at Leon's irreparable disgrace of being sold for a pair of stags. From Pliny H. White, Life and Services of Matthew Leon, page 6. By the spring of 1775, Matthew Leone had taken advantage of the manpower shortage of the American Revolution and joined an obscure ragtag band of guerrilla fighters. Leone and his fellow rebels were destined to enter the annals of historical fame when, not long afterwards, they appeared out of nowhere at Ticonderoga in northern New York where their commander, Ethan Allen, demanded the surrender of the mighty British fort. Matthew Leon had joined the Green Mountain Boys. Eighty-five of us, Leon would later recall with pride, took from 140 British veterans the Fort Ticonderoga. The guns, cannon, and ammunition obtained at Ticonderoga would supply the American army throughout the war. The former slave boy, Matthew Leon, rose to the rank of colonel in Ethan Allen's militia and fought the British at the battles of Bennington and Saratoga. One of the founders of the state of Vermont, he was elected to its assembly and later to the U.S. Congress, <coughs> where the eponymous 
firebrand wrestled a Federalist on the floor of the House of Representatives. He was the first American to be indicted under President John Adams' Sedition Act for publishing material against central federal government and Adams. Forced to run for Congress from a jail cell, Leone was overwhelmingly re-elected and returned to a tumultuous hero's welcome in Vermont. The colonies of Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Maryland declared white slaves eligible to enlist in the Continental Army without their master's consent. Though such decrees had the effect of granting the freedom of those slaves who fought, the American Revolution did not result in a prohibition of the institution of white slavery itself. In rhetoric, it was conceded that white slavery was contrary to the idea of liberty, but the system remained profitable, and many southern and middle colony white slaves had not been allowed to join the Revolutionary Army, and they remained in bondage. The importation of white slaves was resumed after the American Revolution on much the same basis as it had existed before, with the exception of convict slave labor. In 1788, the Continental Congress urged the states to ban the importation of convict slave labor. From W.C. Ford, Journals of the Continental Congress, 1774 through 1789, entry for September 16, 1788. Now, white slave rebellions. Fear of rebellion by white slaves led to the passage of a Virginia law to suppress unlawful meetings, and directed that all masters of families be enjoyed to take especial care that servants do not depart from their houses on Sundays or any other days without particular license from them. Individual acts of rebellion by white slaves were constant, and many slave masters were killed. Unrest among white servants was more or less chronic, from Breidenbaugh, page 108. During the third quarter of the 17th century, impoverished white laborers had kept the Virginia province on the brink of civil war, from Eckridge, page 133. In the Caribbean colonies, white slaves revolted by burning the sugar cane of the slave masters, quote, to the utter ruin and undoing of their masters. Lured to colonial America with the promise of teaching a, a teaching job, Thomas Hellier was instead enslaved as a field worker. That betrayal, combined with the viciousness of his slave master's wife, led him to kill the slave master's entire family with an axe in 1678. Hellier was believed to have been inspired by Bacon's rebellion to years before. <clears throat> in 1676, Nathaniel Bacon led an uprising in Virginia. A small army of former white slaves and fugitive white slaves joined with the 30-year-old Indian fighter Bacon against the House of Burgesses and the governor sparked by anger at their own penurious condition after having been cheated out of the head acreage they were promised and enraged by the royal government's apathy in the face of murderous Indian raids. And there's so much to be said about the murderous Indian raids, by the way, which I doubt Hoffman will go too much into. There was great fear among the circle of the governor, William Berkeley, that the white slaves of the entire region would rise with bacon and carry all beyond remedy to destruction. Bacon's rebels burned down the city of Jamestown, plundered the plantations, and expelled Berkeley. Bacon died suddenly, allegedly of dysentery, on October 26, at the height of the insurrection. 
an incredible number of the meanest, being poorest, of people were everywhere armed to assist him and his cause, and these fought on through the winter, until the last of them were captured or killed by January of 1677. Such combinations of white slaves and landless white freemen were referred to as a giddy multitude with the potential for overthrowing the dominance of the planter grandees. Governor Berkeley despaired of ever subduing a white underclass of people where six parts of seven are poor, indebted, discontented, and armed. From Eckridge, page 134. Other white slave rebellions included the Risings of 1634, which took 800 troops to put down, and 1647, in which 18 leaders of the White Revolt were tortured and hung. The rulers of Barbados passed a proclamation in 1649, quote, an act for an annual day of thanksgiving for our deliverance from the last insurrection of servants." Unquote. Richard Legon was an eyewitness to this white slave plot on Barbados. He says, their sufferings being grown to a great height and their daily complainings to one another being spread throughout the island, at the last some amongst them, whose spirits were not able to endure such slavery, resolved to break through it, or die in the act, and so conspired with some others, so that a day was appointed to fall upon their masters and cut all their throats. From Ligon, page 45. And in Virginia, after mid-century, the number of runaway white servants increased steadily, and in 1661 and 1663, servants in two separate Virginia counties took up arms and demanded freedom. The first episode occurred in York County, where servants complained of hard usage. Isaac Friend, their leader, planned to bring together about 40 servants. They would then get arms, and march through the country, raising recruits by urging servants who would be for liberty and free from bondage to join them. Once a large enough force had been aroused, the rebels would go through the county, country, and kill those that made any opposition, and they would either be free or die for it. From Levine, page 56. I have to break in here. With this information on the table, it gives you a whole, uh, a whole new perspective on the idea of give me liberty or give me death. And who was it really in the Americas that so desired liberty because of the, the harshness of their treatment and their lives that they would gladly die in the pursuance of freedom. Think about it. Simply the, 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 the wealthy aristocracy whom uh, King George's heavy taxes because of his, his debts to international uh, usurious uh, Jews that they would rouse so many to fight this war of independence simply so that they could just expand their profit margin some. Well, perhaps they were steering the ship in that way, and believe me, those of the aristocratic class, which so many of them were, so often times, of course, they fear us, poor, common, white Europeans. 
And they have, over many centuries, they have discovered how to manipulate us so that we don't rise up against them. And so, I still, and remember, what I said at the beginning, people choosing to either omit information or um, and sometimes it seems like they just choose to want to see things certain ways because it more supports their narrative. So many people want to look at uh, so many people in identity. And remember, I'm not in identity. I don't call myself in identity. I just give you what information I've seen. And you can do whatever you want with it. But so many people that like to identify in the dogma of identity, and it is a dogma, just as so many other things are dogmatic. It seems like so many of them really like to see so much about America, specifically the Founding Fathers, so-called, with very rosy-colored glasses. And when they talk about them, they tend to omit so much information. Now, I'll give it to you. Those people that want to look at America as nothing but um, a negative thing, they too omit information the other way. So, which one of them is honest? I say neither. The truth usually does lie somewhere in between, but if we're not afraid to, to look at it and try to understand it and weigh out what things that we can ex extract from it to further ourselves in our pursuit for the truth overall, I think we're far better off. We may end up wrestling with a lot of questions, maybe for a very, very long time. Who knows, perhaps most or all of our lives, but at least we would have remained true to the truth. And that makes it worth it. Again, I digress. <clears throat> so, more white slave plots and revolts occurred in uh, 1686 and 1692, including a rebellion by the independents, in quotes, an insurgent group of white Protestant slaves and freedmen who revolted against Maryland's Catholic theocracy. Revolts on board ships carrying white slaves to America were particularly fearsome. On the least six occasions, white slaves seized ships long enough to neutralize their crews and make good their escape, or they took control completely, often with bloody consequences for masters and crews. Forty Irish slaves, farty, farty Irish slaves, in 1735 ran a vessel aground off Nova Scotia and executed the entire ship's company. Encountering a negro on shore, they slit his throat from ear to ear. In 1751, English slaves from Liverpool shot the ship's captain, drove a spike through the jaw of one of the crew, locked up the remainder, and fled the vessel for the North Carolina coast, where they successfully made their escape from Eckridge, page 109. At the age of five, James Dalton had watched his father hanged at Tyburn Gallows. Around 1720, as a teenager, he was seized, sentenced to enslavement in America, and placed aboard the ship Hanur, uh, bound for Virginia. During a storm at sea, he and 15 other white slaves battled the captain and crew for control of the ship. They won and made their way to the Spanish coast and freedom after a two-week 
voyage. Certain runaways were fiercely determined. The fugitive, Jeff Walden, when threatened with capture by his master's blacksmith, proclaimed that he was upon hasty business and no man should stop him. Choosing rather to suffer death than go back, similarly, John Oulton, after being overtaken by an overseer in Baltimore County, grabbed a knife and stabbed his pursuer in the chest. White slaves who were caught often continued to seek their freedom. References in newspaper advertisements to iron collars and fresh whippings attested to their dogged persistence. One ad for a fugitive white slave stated, The fellow may be easily known, being cut on his back and arms from a late whipping he had on his attempting to run away the night before. From Eckridge, page 203. In 1721, white slaves were arrested while attempting to seize an arsenal at Annapolis, Maryland, the arms to be used in an uprising against the planters. In Florida, in 1768, white slaves revolted at the Turnbull Plantation in New Smyrna. The government needed two ships full of troops and cannon to put down the revolt. A white field slave, Jeremiah Swift, had been hoeing tobacco hills when one of his master's sons demanded that he hoe, quote, a thousand hills before night. Swift attacked him with the hoe, bashing his head in. He then pursued another son, killing him as well. Grabbing an axe and a knife, he entered the master's plantation home, killing one of his daughters and stabbing another. The master, John Hatherley, was not at home at the time. This from the Pennsylvania Gazette, May 9th, May 16th, June 27th, 1751. Perhaps the most perversely eloquent testimony of the sort of rage and madness that was engendered by treating white men like beasts was offered by a white slave in Maryland. Worked half to death, he stopped his labor, grabbed an axe, and in the familiar pattern, headed for his master's plantation house, where he confronted the man's wife. His intent was not homicide, however. Laying his own hand on his mistress's kitchen cutting block, he brought his axe down full force upon it. Now make me work if you can, he screamed, as he threw his severed hand at her. From the Maryland Gazette, April 17, May 1, 1751. If the servant class threw up one radical hero, it was Cornelius Bryan, an Irish servant imprisoned for mutiny on countless occasions and regularly whipped by the hangman for assembling servants and publicly making anti-planter remarks. From Beckles, Rebels and Reactionaries, page 18. I must interject. It is, it is in the spirit of such people who are turned into laborious, tormented beasts that they will, they will eventually turn on those who enslave them. There are the elements that are currently holding sway over this world, <clears throat> over my country, over many others, who somehow believe that they can continue their attacks 
on white Anglo-Saxon peoples. And do yourself a favor. If you're listening to this and your reaction since I've started all of this has been uh, a very negative reaction when I bring up white Anglo-Saxon and kindred people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who bear the marks of this, you instantly get turned off and you don't know or don't believe that it's the way you've been programmed that you have been programmed to be a Judeo Christian understand that these elites are waging a war against white Anglo-Saxon people and their kindred they're waging a war on us. They have stopped us a long time ago from prolifically reproducing large families while getting all other kinds of other races into our countries and causing them to prolifically breed. They ruin our culture with pornography, with Hollywood garbage propaganda, with drugs, with disgusting philosophies, with every kind of pseudo-scientific theory that would cause our young people to question the validity of the Bible. They are the ones waging war on us. It is not us who decided to wage war on them. But here's the thing about this I'd like all of them to take into consideration, if they even can. You you are waging a war not against man not against flesh and blood you are attempting to exterminate a people you are committing genocide on a people and you may not believe this but consider since all of the factors point to the Anglo-Saxon and kindred peoples as being the very descendants of the so-called Lost Tribes of Israel, and since it's very clear from the Word that Yahweh is not done with Israel, for even Paul says that we are beloved for the Father's sake. Are you really willing to put your hand against those people who are still, as he calls us, his possession, his inheritance, his beloved, the apple of his eye? Those of us who he promised before Christ came, he promised that he wasn't done with us. He'd redeem us. He would write his laws in our hearts and that we would be called the sons of the living God. Perhaps you're doing it because your father, Satan, understands that he really only has a short time. So, in a sort of manic brutality, you are doing his will and trying your best to exterminate every one of my people. But it's going to go so badly for you in the end. Remember, 
that you may be able to kill the body, but you are not able to destroy body and soul as Yahweh can. And you're going to be judged because everyone will give account. So if you can hear it, if you can even understand, I recommend you cease and desist your evil behavior before it's too late. Because eventually it will be. The British colonial government was not adverse to calling on unlikely policemen to suppress white slave revolts. Blacks. Blacks were admitted to the colonial militia responsible for policing white slaves. The aristocratic planters had felt the necessity to arm part of their black men to assist in suppressing white slave revolts from Beckles, Rebels and Reactionaries, page 17. Armed black militias patrolled the Carolinas from the end of the 17th century to at least 1710, when Thomas Nairn reported that blacks continued to be the members of British colonial militias organized by local governments. In Maryland, in 1715, a reward was offered to American Indians who were recruited as bounty hunters to capture runaway whites and return them to their masters for the better discovery of and encouragement of our neighbor Indians to seize, apprehend, or take up any runaway servants. It was decreed that for every fugitive white laborer the Indians caught and brought before a magistrate, they shall, for a reward, have a match coat paid him or them, or the value thereof, from Maxey's Laws of Maryland, Volume 1, page 111. White rebellions foreshadowed the later switch from reliance on masses of white slaves to greater and greater importation of blacks because of their pliability and passivity. But throughout the 17th and much of the 18th century, the tobacco, sugar, and cotton colonies maintained a sizable white slave population. Negro slaves simply cost too much to import and purchase whites were cheaper and more expendable until they began to fight. Planters, especially in the South, eventually elected to replace the restive white servants with the more identifiable and presumably less criminal black slaves. From Vanderzee, page 266. The toughness and sturdiness of the white slaves who not only fought in Bacon's rebellion but took the worst duty in the French and Indian Wars and the American Revolution may have been due in part to the presence of convicts in their ranks. Convicts provided the colonies with cannon fodder against the Spanish, the French, and the Indians. From Eckridge, page 153. Not all colonists looked with favor on the reliance upon white convict slave labor to build America. Benjamin Franklin opposed white slavery and supposedly referred to white convict slaves shipped to America as human serpents. Good old Ben Franklin. While British convicts frequently rebelled against their enslavement, their transportation to America did not generally result in a crime wave, because most of them were not professional criminals at all, as the aristocracy had alleged, but surplus British farmhands and urban poor people who had been labeled as criminals and swept from Britain to furnish the cheap white labor essential to the American colonial enterprise. Surviving court records show that in areas of colonial America where convicts were imported in large numbers, they committed very few offenses. Crime never became a major social problem before the revolution, from Eckridge pages 4 and 186. Overall, 
most of the convicts were not the atrocious villains so often spoken of from Shaw, page 164. When attempts were made to abolish white slavery and thereby stop the flow of both kidnapped and convict labor into colonial America, the measures were generally voted down, as when in 1748 Virginia's Burgesses upheld the Act of 1705, which legitimized white slavery under a veil of legal phraseology. Some things never change. White convict labor was used for the very harshest and life-threatening jobs others would not do, such as fighting the Indians and French in Arctic conditions with few, if any, firearms. Benjamin Franklin had been apprenticed at age 12 to his printer brother. The term of his indenture was to have been for nine years but he managed to have his contract voided while his brother was in jail for seditious publishing. A young man, Franklin was once mistaken for a fugitive white slave, and in danger of being taken up on that suspicion. The notion that whites are particularly hard-hearted and racist because they upheld a fugitive slave law against blacks is specious when considered in light of the enactments against rebellious and fugitive white slaves. If a tiny clique of wealthy whites didn't feel sorry for their own people thus enslaved and hunted them when they escaped or revolted, why would anyone expect them to exempt Negroes from the same treatment. Sometimes the reverse was true. Whites like Harriet Beecher Stowe were solely concerned with the plight of blacks, and avoided or denied the oppression of whites. Like the wealthy, liberal, white elite of our time, who do nothing for the white poor, but campaign tirelessly for the rights of colored people, the Quakers of colonial Philadelphia were early advocates of black rights and abolition of Negro servitude, even as some Quakers whipped and brutalized the white slaves they continued to own. <clears throat> There's some interviews available with Michael Hoffman uh, on different books and articles and things he's done. I've found from listening to a few of these interviews that um, Michael Hoffman, like many men, is influenced concerning his worldview and his um, biblical views by his choice to remain in the system of Roman Catholicism and to support popery, which is why I'm very glad that he so tirelessly, exhaustively cites his sources. With this much citation, it's difficult to put too much of your own spin on it. And that much I'm very glad for. And now, given the <clears throat> liberality of the papacy and the Vatican, and their, at least their public views these days, I am surprised that Michael Hoffman is able to do the things he does, talk about the things he does, without being excommunicated, disallowed from communion, which is excommunication. If you're not allowed communion, you're not Catholic. You're not in the Roman Catholic Church. It's a shame that a lot of his views 
are so heavily influenced by his Catholicism. In some instances, in interviews uh, I've listened to, I've noticed that his views are even more influenced by uh, Catholicism than by the pure word of the Bible. I'm not... I am not outright in a full frontal way calling him um, a deceiver or the deceived, but he is he is part of an apostate religion that believes many, many, many things that are endemic marks of Baal worship. And I know that that's this very black and white, harsh way of saying it, but we can see in evangelical Christianity at large that most of it is, in fact, Baal worship the things they celebrate, the ideas that they support, unbiblical things. Do you know how difficult it is to try to just convince somebody that our God, His name isn't God, His name isn't Lord. He has a name. He has a name that He gave to Israel and used nearly 7,000 times in the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi alone. And I think what portions of the scriptures of the New Testament that were written in Hebrew use his name as well. His name is Yahweh or Yahweh. Now, some people want to say it's Yahweh. Some people want to say it's Jehovah, and I've heard some say it's Yehovah. In my own studies, I've seen that for the most part, the evidence points to Yahweh. Yahweh. More than Yah, yeah, Yahweh. He has a name. He used it nearly 7,000 times. In the Tanakh. But today people want to still just go by Lord and God. And that's what they called their Baals in older times. Because even Paul says there's many lords, there's many gods. Now, of course, they do distinguish him still by at least acknowledging the personal name of his son, the Greek then to English translation, Jesus, which is probably far, far more accurate to say his name is Yehoshua. Yeshua being the truncated, but Yehoshua. At least they're identifying the only begotten Son of our true God. But our true God, He has a name, Yahweh. And I pray all the time that His people will stop their Baal worship and stop believing their, their pagan beliefs and worship the true living God in His Son, Yehoshua, Jesus, the Anointed. So with all this being said, I'll get back off my soapbox for the day, and uh, I pray that you think on these things, and that this is empowering to you, no matter <clears throat> what your background, your race, your color, your ethnicity. This should be empowering information. So, till next time, I hope you do well. <laughs>